Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. The Robert E. Howard Days, our annual Fists of the Ice House panel. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I'm always surprised when more than two people show up. Uh, it's uh, it's very exciting to uh, always have to be talking to new people about uh, about Robert E. Howard. So thank you guys for for being here. Uh, my name is Mark Finn. Hi, Mark. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, I'm the guy that wrote Blood and Thunder, The Life and Art of Robert E. Howard. Is that you? Uh, that was me. No kidding. Uh, this is uh, Chris Gruber. Hi. Uh, he's the editor of Boxing Stories and one of the co-editors on Fists of uh, Iron. And this is Jeff Shanks, uh, one of my, uh, and we're all three part of Skellos Press. And what's your, what, what, what's your Howard thing? Oh, the, oh, the, the Weird, Weird Tales book. Yeah. Yes. Unique Legacy of Weird Tales. The Unique Legacy of Weird Tales. Oh. Stoker nominated. We are all <laughs> super boxing fans. Uh, show of hands, if this is your first uh, yeah. time at the Ice House panel, please let us know. Okay, uh, oh. we're gonna we're gonna do something a little different than we uh, have done, uh, and I'll explain briefly what why we're why we're here and what we're doing. The Ice House served a very important role in Robert E. Howard's uh, day and age. Uh, back in the 1880s, uh, there were articles on the harvesting of ice. Uh, from frozen lakes in farmers' almanacs and gentlemen's quarterlies and things like that. Uh, the purpose of it, uh, of course, the ice was to uh, for preservation, to prevent spoilage. As refrigeration techniques and as insulation techniques uh, got better, uh, the one of the first applications for ice was uh, in refrigerated cars uh, for for freight. Uh, you could put your sides of beef in refrigerated ice cars and take them down the line and sell them farther away than you could if they were in town where you had like 30 minutes to get home in the god awful heat. Uh, so this was a huge advantage. Not long after all of these advances started taking place, ice houses started popping up conveniently along railroad lines. Uh, and the reason is because uh, they could run the uh, the cars in, literally dump ice into the into the freight cars that were insulated with uh, sawdust and tar and just anything to keep the cold in, and go on down the line. Now in Texas, uh, the ice house uh, was also a place where it was very conducive uh, for the brewing of adult beverages. <laughs> Because you had, uh, you're basically the, in cold vaults. Uh, Texas doesn't have a lot of basements uh, where you would, would uh, brew uh, heavier things. But in a cold, dark environment, uh, you know, ales and stouts would firm it up nicely. Hmm. Once prohibition was passed, uh, they just took the barrels and moved them to the back of the ice house where no one could see. And then you would walk up. I ha uh, one of uh, one of my re one of my the people I used for researching Blood and Thunder uh, was the uh, director of the Petroleum Museum in, at the Permian Basin, and we were talking about ice houses. He said in my town, the legend was uh, you'd walk up to the ice house and ask for a five dollar bag of ice. The five dollar bag of ice was a bag of ice with a six pack of beer in it, <laughs> and that was the code. You know, so you knew what to ask for and how to get it. Uh, in all the years, and, and so this was this was very important to Robert because it was a uh, a chance to come drink beer and hang out with friends. But on Friday nights and Saturday nights, when everybody was off work and the tool dressers were in town, uh, they'd come over here and blow off steam, and they'd put on the gloves or sometimes not, and they would do a little uh, boxing. Well, I need to learn that code first. <laughs> you do need to I learn need that, that code. code. So one of the things we've never done here at the Ice House is done what Robert did and drink. So we are going to do a little of that yep. tonight. Yeah. This, so this is a... We should, we should point out here that uh, you know, while Robert, they would have most likely been drinking beer. Bob Howard liked beer. That was his main thing. We're not going to be drinking beer, but we're going to be drinking something that I feel Thank you. Bob Howard would have absolutely appreciated. This is John L. Sullivan Irish whiskey. The 10 count. The 10 count, which is uh, the 10 year. Yes. And this is good stuff here. Yes. 
But we have to watch out because when Groove starts drinking this stuff, he gets a little feisty. No, it was, it was me. It oh, was, it was you. I, I was the one who, who lost my mind. Oh, I, don't, I, don't I don't even know. remember. I'm in D.C. I don't even remember. Oh, oh, yeah. No, okay, I do remember that. Yeah. Yes, I do. So we don't know what's going to happen tonight. That actually happened. When the John L. starts flowing. To, to, to Robert to Shade. To Bob Howard. Robert e. Howard. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Man, yeah. Part of the... Um, what a flashback. I'm part of what we're doing here... We're, this is a little bit of, a little bit of back padding. Uh, Mark Finn and I have been doing a version of this panel for years and years and years. It's 2003. Yeah, 2003. So, geez, really? Four. Yeah. I'm that old. We're that old. <laughs> well, I can say this. Um, I was really into the boxing stories. Uh, Mark, I found a. Let's see, you and Leo Grin. I found two people that uh, also liked the boxing stories, but nobody else seemed to care. It wasn't that they were uh, angry with them or they didn't like them. They just didn't care. And then when you really pushed them, they hadn't read the stories at all. They heard about them. They knew they were there, but it just wasn't important. The more I read, the more <laughs> I laughed. And I, I'm, not, I'm not a garrulous person. I, I don't really just laugh for no reason. The Sailor Steve Costigan stories made me laugh. Uh, two of them actually, yes, made me cry. I, um, I've been a kickboxer. I've boxed, uh, sparred with... God, I don't know how many years. Um, I'm a martial arts instructor, Krav Maga, self-defense. So this, it's kind of like my alley. This is, this is the area I play in. Uh, and here's an author who I came to through Conan and, and his, and his uh, fantasy, Sword and Sorcery, Blood and Thunder. And here he had the ability to write funny stories in a modern setting. He had the ability to, to take a, a, a very limited genre in boxing and make me want to read another story, and another story, and another story, and another story. And he had different types of boxing stories. It was another whole world. It seemed like every time I went you know, down to the library or, or to my bookstore, there was some new thing. And the boxing was the latest thing. It became a passion. We started coming here, oh, so long ago. It, we, we, let's see, we used to walk, we used to walk from there in the well, blazing sun. And we thought, wait, what? I said, we'll get five, uh, if we get five people, that'd be great, because if we can get one person reading the story, that's, that's the first brick on the road, right? It, it's, as you can see, we got a pretty good turnout. Uh, it's, it's late at night, 9 o'clock. Over the years, people have really come to enjoy these stories with us. Uh, there's podcasts about the boxing stories. We've got, <laughs> we've got people uh, interviewing us about what we think about the boxing stories. Fifteen years ago, nobody was reading these yeah. Wonderful stories. Shout out to the guys that do the Chromecast. Chromecast. Yeah. Uh, they've been doing a Robert E. Howard based uh, podcast for several years now. Each season, they cover a different aspect of Howard's writing. And this season is all about the boxing stories. And that's our fault. Yeah, we did Absolutely. That. We, we, and so we're very, we're, very, we're very proud of spreading the, uh, spreading the love. Yeah. So, so I came to this a little late. I was just, we were going there. Oh, but go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so, so here's my thing, and it's interesting that you, you talked about that, how coming to Howard with the fantasy and all that, and of course I did the same thing back in, you know, you read the Conan stories and then later call it Solomon Cage and all that. And it, was, it wasn't until I got to college, and I was very fortunate, my library at FSU had a number of, uh, had all of the other uh, Donald Grants, had the whole Donald Grants, mm -hmm. also had numbers of chat books and things like that. So. I immediately I was like, oh my god, and wrote boxing stories because I was also a boxing fan growing up. I grew up in Pensacola, Florida, which is the hometown of Roy Jones Jr. So, Je right? Jeff has a really interesting uh, background <laughs> when it comes to, to MMA too, and I'm sure he'll get to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. talk about that a little bit. But you know, when uh, when I was in high school, I I volunteered when Roy was just starting out. Everybody knows Roy Jones Jr. Roy Jones Jr. Right? Does everybody know who Roy Jones Jr. is? Come on, right? No. Pensacola, Florida. Come on. One of the, you know, great boxers, yeah. light heavyweight champion, middleweight champion. Um, I would go down and I would volunteer to help set up the ring so I could get in for free to watch the fights, you know, back in the day in the early part of his career. Um, so, you know, always been a lifelong boxing fan. Um, and so when I found out that, just like you, that Howard, the guy that I, yeah, I enjoyed the Conan stories for when I was younger, wrote boxing stories, man, that was amazing. And the first thing I picked up was Donald Grant, Donald Grant Iron Man. Um, so for me, it was the, the serious boxing oh, stories wow. before um, I got into the... I think I knew that, but I yeah, forgot. You know, and yeah. so Iron Man was always a, a special place in my heart. Now, man, I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my God, he gets it. He knows it. Yeah. This is great. You know, he was as much of a fanboy as I was. And uh, so 
that was amazing to me. So when I got involved in Howard Thurman, you guys were already doing this. I immediately gravitated straight to the, oh my God, yes, Oh, thank God, we got somebody else who likes him too. Finally, yeah, yeah, Leo, had, Leo had gone away, and so we were like, "Well, we're a man down." Oh, thank God, here comes Shaq. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so what we're doing here, what we're doing here is this is going to be a conversation. Uh, we're going to have a conversation among ourselves. So we're going to have a conversation with you all. If there's any questions you have, we're going to we're going to sip this unbelievably good this whiskey good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we're going to talk we're going to talk about the things that we've done the, the stories that we like uh, we have no script tonight so you know I, I want to go back down memory lane though real quick okay. so when we first started uh, Leo Grin's like what is he 6'7 he's 9'4 9'4 he's about 9'4 and he, uh, he we did this the first time it was like 100 <laughs> Five degrees, 110 degrees. Three in the afternoon across, on a Saturday, you know. Walking yeah. by the uh, cemetery over there, over here, right? So people got lost. We finally made it here. And I could tell everybody was beat. They were tired. My feet hurt. I'm sweating. I stink. You know, everyone had a complaint. And I thought, this is the worst way we could start uh, trying to convince people to read these stories. Well, uh, I, no one knew who I was. I, I mean, no one knew who I was. So I, I started walking around the crowd. And I started bumping into people on, on, on purpose, you know. Hey, watch it. I picked on Leo for a second. Leo's like, again, was it, you said 10'6"? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 10 foot 6. <laughs> he, he's huge, and I, I bump into him, and I go, what's your problem? And he, he looks down at me, he goes, what? Like, I go, no, no, not, not you, you. What's your problem? Like, and that's how it all started. We, you know, I wanted people just to have some fun, but what happened here was a lot like that. You had people that knew each other, hanging out, just having fun, drinking, drinking some, who knows what they were drinking. Yeah. Uh, beer, <laughs> could be anything. But what it really was, was an opportunity for some of them to, uh, you know, just kick back, get away from whatever troubles ailed them that day. After a hard day's work, and they might have rolled around in here and fought a little bit. We know. Letters, you know, the friends talked about it. Robert certainly talked about it. And he, he embellished, even in his letters, he, he did such a great job talking about how he fought these people. You get wrapped up just in the letters, let alone the, the stories. Yeah. So that's what we're doing here. So. I, I had a, uh, uh, I, I did something else in addition to this. Um, for a while I ran a radio troupe in Austin. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, um, I was con we were looking for original material to do and I was convinced that the, that the boxing stories would make good radio plays. Uh, and to use a variation of a quote uh, from somebody uh, famous, I, I looked at the story and cut away everything that wasn't a radio script. And uh, so I specifically picked my favorite story to do for the first one, and um, which is the Destiny Gorilla, mm -hmm. for reasons which, if you know me, are pretty obvious. <laughs> and so, um, but it was a... You're my favorite gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a... Um, it was, I was really surprised at not only how easily it became a radio play, and, but how quickly everybody got into it, but it, it, it forced me to do something that I hadn't done, and it actually ended up being a piece of scholarship for me. Uh, I, of course, was going to play Sailor Steve Costigan. I wasn't going to let anybody do that one but me, but I had to figure out Steve's accent. When I first read these stories uh, back in the early 90s, uh, I had just come off of reading Damon Runyon's uh, Bandits of Broadway stuff. So the dialect that I was reading him in was a kind of a Brooklynese sort of Bugs Bunny sounding kind of a thing. Or the Three Stooges, you know? Nah, your ears are too short. You know, that kind of, that kind of sound. Um, but uh, as soon as I hit the, the stuff that talked about him being from Galveston, I realized, oh, this is a Texan. I've got, to, I've got to do this in a completely different way. And so I literally struggled all through that first rehearsal process trying to figure out what accent to use because everybody knows there's a West Texas accent and there's an East Texas accent. And if you get those wrong, you can get hit, <laughs> for real. So um, I had to kind of decide and make some choices. But once I started reading it in that, in that style, uh, the stories opened up. They opened up like a flower because Howard would dictate these things aloud as he typed. And so, you know, in, in doing this, he's saying the things he's typing. So now I've got Howard's voice in my head typing the story that Steve Costigan, which goes back, it's, it was like a weird little feedback loop. But it was astonishing. Uh, and it, 
I think doing the stories that way, and I've been reading them that way ever since, I think I've actually changed the way people read those stories. I, without a doubt. In fact, yeah. twice today I've I had people voice, reference yeah. the way you speak <laughs> when, I read crazy. when you read. And you get you get to hear it tonight. So, so. if I don't pass out, first. Yeah, so pass out. Let's, let's set the let's set the stage and set the context a little bit. Um, boxing, you know, while it's still a very popular sport, it's not uh, at the level of popularity. He's, he's going down for count. <laughs> One, so, two, good. Okay. It's not the same level of popularity it was in Bob Howard's day, right? In the early part of the 20th century, boxing was one of the major sports in America. There were three sports, really, that mattered in the early part of the 20th century. And that was baseball, horse racing, and boxing. And the one thing they all had in common is people like to bet on it. Yeah. Right? So that was, that was the, the boxing, the NBA of his time. It was baseball, boxing, and horse racing. So it was huge. You know, this was a big sport. And so it's not unusual that you would get uh, guys coming here, the, the, the oil field hands, you know, the, the roughnecks coming here, <coughs> the farm workers, you know, getting off work and coming here, like you said, blowing off some steam in here. That's like, it would be like today just going and doing a pickup game of basketball, yeah, right. right? Same kind of thing. Everybody would do this, you know? And so imagine this ice house, right? It would have been cramped. It wouldn't have been open like, uh, like this. You'd have had bales of hay all around, right? People sitting on bales of hay with ice all over the place in a really cramped, confined space where guys were fighting with literally people up above you on hay bales, hanging from the rafters, literally almost, you know, essentially. So a claustrophobic kind of feel, right? Where guys are just trapped in there like fighting in a phone booth style. And you get that sometimes in Howard's stories. The first costume story is a great example of that. Uh, Pit of the Serpent, serpent right? So this is a story, are, are people, how many people here are familiar with the character Sailor Steve Costigan? Right, most of you are oh, familiar wow. with him, right, good. Okay, for those who aren't, Sailor Steve, he's a, a, a merchant, you know, he's sail, a sailor on a steam tramp, uh, or a tramp steamer ship, and he goes from port to port, and he always gets into trouble, and these are humorous stories, and he always ends up getting in a fight. In this particular story, he ends up getting in an underground boxing match, a bare knuckle boxing match in a concrete pit, right, and it's, the way it's described, you know, he's in this tiny little pit, and he's in there, and he's slugging, and he's fighting, and they're fighting in there, and you can tell he's scraping his elbows on the walls as he's fighting, and you can you can really get that feel of that confined space that he's in there fighting in, you know, and that's coming from this place, that's coming from here, you know, that feeling of the ice house. Yeah. And so you're reading these stories and being in here in this space, you really kind of you try to envision that, um, you know, as we hear these stories, what it was like here, these guys. You know, amateurs, you know, maybe with some talent, maybe not much talent, drawing in here, shedding blood, spilling their DNA. There's probably yeah. Bob Howard DNA. Somewhere on this path. Right out, out here in the cracks, you know, still to this day. Mark, you want to read us a little something? Uh, yeah, oh. I'm looking. Yeah, what do While you he's looking, is it, you know, any questions about what we're talking about? Is there anything that... You say it was real cramped. Yeah. yeah. The power was funny. How cramped exactly was it? Well, you know, we have one photograph. From, oh yes. Remember, we have one photograph. It's not pretty amazing. From this ice house, but from what, what was it? It's just down down the road. Uh, Eastland. Yeah, um, uh, Eastland, wasn't it? Uh, Eastland, Texas. Eastland. Yeah, oh, is it, is it Eastland? Yeah, um, so we have we have one photograph from approximately the same time of people boxing in an ice house, just just down the road. He, when he said they were on the rafters, they were literally on the rafters. Literally so on the rafters. Everyone just wanted to get a view and just. Right. Look like two farm kids just yeah, just going, going at, at right, it. You know? And, you know, some people are tipping it back. Uh, right. uh, I would say probably based on the photo, and this is purely a guess. Right. At most, they had these four squares. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe a little bit more. Little uh, but the people right on the action. Right. Uh, as, and and <laughs> it was it was pretty intense. There was About there, 10, was, there was no room for a uh, a Floyd Mayweather. No. Show. <laughs> in this kind of environment, if you, if you guys are familiar with Floyd Mayweather, right? You weren't dancing around on the outside, right. sticking and moving no, in you, here. You, you, know? you, you came in from the center. You right. bored in, and yeah. that was and that was Howard's style that he liked. That was what he liked. He liked the guys that were tough guys that could take damage. What he called an Iron Man, right? The guys that you know maybe they weren't maybe they didn't always win, but they fought their, to their last breath. And they took a beating like no one could, and they didn't go down, and they toughed it out. You know, and if they, they did go down, they went down with a bloody frothing curse yeah. on their lips, right? That's that's the kind of fighter that Howard liked. And you can see that not just in his boxing fiction, 
right? But in all of his fiction, Obviously. in his fantasy fiction as well, you get that. Yeah, that's why even his his fight scenes in his fantasy fiction, they have that visceral, violent, real feel. Personal. To them. It's coming from his box. It's, it's very personal too. You know, yeah. it's up close. It's it's it's. There's no sword in between right. uh, these people. If the boxing stories themselves are are built, they're a construct that predates. Um, the Hyborian Age, for instance. Uh, the boxing stories that he's talking about, Iron Man, he throws actual lore in. I mean, the real boxers, real history, over and over again. Uh, the, the antagonists, protagonists, they're all reflections of people he either knew, he read about, uh, idolized. These were important, important things. He was young at this time, too. He was pretty early right, in yeah. his career as a writer. And already you can see all the, all the things that make his best fiction sing makes it special it's in these stories as well it's just in a completely different way I mean he has a very very fleshed out um, that better not be empty oh, no. ah. what the hell Jeff <laughs> um, it's a it's a uh, really fleshed out universe he's got his own boxers I mean he took the time whether it was intentional or not it happens he's got boxers talking or to me uh, characters talking about a boxing match that he actually wrote about in one story and they reference a manager from another story whether it was published or not uh, and he kept these facts and figures straight uh, because it was important to him he, he wanted to know all the real boxers names he wanted to know all the pageantry that, that made them great what, what was it about these guys that he had to know every little thing How, did they leave with their left did they leave with their right were they soft plus uh, do they like to take it to the bread basket, or, or do they, you know, was it overhand right, right hook, left hook? He would write these notes, uh, meticulous notes. He wrote poems. It, it was, it was for a long time, it was his world, really. Yeah, and it was, a, it was, a, it was a cohesive universe. One of the first instances of world building that he did, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things. That it, it's so fun. Um, I just recently entered into a thing called the International Boxing Research Organization. So uh, I'm in this research organization about looking at boxing, boxing history. And I got into it because of <laughs> Robert Yard, because yep. I was researching all these real boxers and trying to find out. I, I found all these, well, John L. Sullivan, for instance, uh, Tom Sharkey, uh, Fitzsimmons, uh, uh, Jeffries, all these boxers, and even, even guys like uh, Goddard and um, uh, Joe Grimm, uh, right. all these Ironmen. Yeah. Uh, and there's been some really, really good authors who've written about boxing. Yeah. And one of the best literary constructs for, for boxing fiction has got to be the Iron Man, the way he does it. Yeah. Jack London, uh, Hemingway, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, all these Jim people. Tully, 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 but really right. Yeah. They've all written about it, and, and Robert E. Howard's best boxing uh, examples are every bit, if not as good, if not better, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Uh, I'll leave it to you when you read it if you agree or not, yeah. uh, but hopefully you do. Ready to fire away? Let's I, yeah, this go is, for it. I'll, I'll, <coughs> this is one of my favorites to read aloud because uh, it's um, oh, it's tough again. No, it's Costigan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Sluggers on the Beach. Hold, I just, just, hold on. Uh, Jeff, you got to take the top off. Oh. <laughs> See? There we go. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, now. Yeah, you're done. He for the county. He, is, he <laughs> works for the government. Stand in a county. He works for the government. Sluggers on the Beach is one of my favorite Howard stories because of the the uh, language play awesome. and, and the opening is just great. Um, I haven't done this today, so uh, hopefully this will work. Um, but this is the this was this was one of the ones that eventually got adapted into a script. The minute I seen the man which was going to referee my fight with Slip Harper in the Amusement Palace Fight Club Shanghai, I taken a violent dislike to him. His name was Houlihan, a fighting sailor same as me, and he was a big red-headed gorilla with hands like hairy hams, and he carried himself with a swagger which put my teeth on edge. He looked like he thought he was the king of the waterfront, and that there is the title I aspires to myself. I detest these conceited jackasses. I'm glad that egotism ain't amongst my faults. <laughs> Nobody'd ever know from my conversation that I was the bully of the toughest ship afloat and the terror of bucko mates from Valparaiso to Singapore. I'm that modest, I don't think I'm half as good as I really am. <laughs> but Red Houlihan got under my hide with his strutting and giving instructions in that foghorn bellerism. And when he discovered that Slip Harper was an old shipmate of his'n, 
His actions grow unbearable. He made this discovery in the third round whilst counting over Harper, who had stuffed one of my man-killing left hooks with his chin. Seven, eight, nine, said Hula, and then he stopped counting and said, by golly, ain't you the Johnny Harper that used to be aboard the old Saigon? Yeah, yeah, goggled Harper groggily, getting to his legs while the crowd went hysterical. What's eating you, Houlihan? I roared indignantly. Go on, counting. He gives me a baleful glare. I'm referee in this mill, he said. You tend to your part of it. By golly, Johnny, I ain't seen you since I broke jail in Calcutta. But Johnny was up at last and trying to keep me from taking him apart, all of which prevented was the gong. Houlihan helped Harper to his corner, and they kept up an animated conversation. Till the next round started, or rather, Houlihan did. Harper wasn't in much condition to enjoy conversation, having three left molars embedded in my right glove. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst we was wanging away on each other during the fourth, I was aware of Houlihan's voice. Stand up to him, Johnny, he said. I'll see that you get a square deal. Go on, sink in your left. That right to the guts don't hurt us none. Pay no attention to them body blows. He's bound to weaken soon. And rage beyond control, I turned on him and said, Look here, you red-headed baboon, are you a referee or a second? I don't know what retort he was fixing to make, because just then Harper, taking advantage of my abstraction, to slam me behind the ear with all he had. Maddened by this perfidy, I turned and sunk my left to the hilt in his midriff, whereupon he turned a beautiful shade of pea green. <laughs> Tie him up, Johnny, urged Hulan. Shut up, Red, gurgled Harper, trying to clench. You're making him mad, he's taking it out on me. <laughs> well, we can take it, said Hulan, but at that moment, I tagged Harper on the ear with a meat cleaver right, and he'd done a nosedive to Hulan's extreme disgust. One, he hollered, waving his arm like a jib boom. Two, three, get up, Johnny. This baboon can't fight. Maybe he can't, said Johnny dizzily, squinting up from the canvas with his hair full of resin. But if he hits me again like he done, I'm like a candidate for a heart. And I hate music. You can count all night if you want to, Red, but as far as I'm concerned, the party's over. Houlihan gave a snort of disgust and grabbed my right arm and raised it and hollered, Ladies and gents, it is with the deepest regret that I announce this boneheaded gorilla is the winner. With a beller of wrath, I jerked my arm away from him and hung a clout on his proboscis that knocked him head first through the ropes. Before I could dive out on top of him, as was my firm intention, I was seized from behind by ten special policemen. Roughhouse is so common in the amusement palace that the promoter is always prepared. <laughs> Whilst I was being interfered with by these misguided idiots, Houlihan rose from amongst the ruins of the benches and the customers he had fell amongst and tried to crawl back into the ring, bellowing like a bull of spurting blood all over everything. But a large number of people fell on him with piercing yells and dragged him back and sat on him. Meanwhile, 40 or 50 friends of the promoter had come to the rescue of the 10 cops, and eventually I found myself back in my dressing room. Without having been able to glut my righteous wrath on Red Houlihan's huge carcass, he'd been carried out through one door while several dozen men was hauling me through another. It's a good thing for them I'd left my white bulldog Mike aboard the Sea Girl. So, yeah. that's uh. Yeah. Uh, you like you like how he says uh, it's not hurting us any. Yeah, yeah that it's not hurting us. <laughs> we can take it. It doesn't hurt us there. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I mean, when you read when you read uh, King Cole or Brand McMorn, I love those stories. By the way, I, I'm just a huge fan. Yeah, we're all fans of the fans. It's huge. Too, uh, King Cole for me especially. But when you when you read those, it's almost as if you've got two different people. One of the beautiful things about Howard is that every time I discovered one character, there was somebody else in a different milieu that I could latch onto and learn all, read all the great stories and, and enjoy all over again. It felt like I was opening a present every time I opened up a different story to read. It was a different experience and it was a fulfilling experience in vastly different ways. And for me, though, the boxing stuff, as you can hear, just it's hilarious. There's there's serious boxing stories too, though. Yeah. Uh, but the humor, if you haven't read, how many people have read any of Howard's humorous stories? If not the costume stories, the Breckenridge Alpin stories, right? I mean, it's very different, isn't it? I mean, the first time you read that, you're like, God, this is Robert E. Howard, really? Wow. And look, you know, at, and look so, at how it, fast it's it. It's good, it's funny. The narrative just flows, man. You know? I mean, he just flies through it. You and know exactly what's happening. And humor is difficult. 
I mean, humor is difficult to get right. The timing and all that just, and, and he nails it. He gets the yeah, dialect, he gets the there. Um, but the thing that they have in common, too, though, is they, they're, it's still, there, there's a number of themes that are still common to his humorous stories and to his, uh, his fantasy fiction that people are more familiar with. One is the violence, right? This visceral, you know, understanding of humans striving against humans, right? That, that's something that's always that's there. That's a conflict. You know, um, Costigan, in going to all of these exotic ports, right? He is, he is the barbarian, right, entering into these exotic civilizations and ends up being a monkey wrench into the goings on in their civil, civilizations and uh, things go awry, but he still, he is himself and he thrives and he prevails. You know, just like Conan does. Um, uh, and Breckenridge Elkins is very similar with the humorous Western story, same kind of idea. So the, the, those primal themes are still there. I, you, know? you know, along those same lines, right. uh, I feel like Howard's boxing characters are, they're entering the ring, they're, they're often described as ungainly, right. almost animal-like in their appearance, uh, tougher than normal. Bull in China shop, essentially. Uh, civilization doesn't suit them. Yeah. Uh, and Howard, throughout his fiction, like it, you know, he, he, he termed it atavism, the idea of uh, perfection through regression. <laughs> uh, you know, the, that somewhere along the distant past, that's where the the, the, the best example of man was. Right. And these men that exist now uh, are, you know, they're effeminate, they're 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 sly, devious, and his boxers are naive, straightforward, straight shooters, uh, physical, tough. Tough yeah. guys, yeah, essentially, but, but but hearts of gold, hearts of gold, and usually a head full of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a, um, uh, I was I was taken initially by the Jeff Jones covers on the Zebra books, oh. uh, and I actually uh, discovered the stories that the Dennis Dorgan stuff oh, yeah. long before uh, anything else, and actually. Um, the first story I read out of the, I opened to the chapter of contents, and I went, uh, 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 the Destiny and Gorilla, I'm going to read that one first. Um, and I was uh, living with my buddy John Lucas at the time, and he came, he opened the door to find me on the floor just laughing hysterically. He said, what the hell's wrong with you? I said, you got to read this. So I just handed it to him, because Lucas is also a, a Howard kid. One day I'm going to get him up here to Howard Days, and he's going to love it. Uh, and by the end of the story, he was laughing along with me. He's like, what? he said, what is this? I said, it's Robert E. Howard. He goes, you're kidding me. <laughs> um, but the, the, the serious stuff, um, I like it. But what I, what I think is more significant about the, the funny boxing and later the funny westerns is, if you only come to Howard through Tony, if you only know Howard through the, the fantasy stuff, there's a whole other side of Robert E. Howard in these in these stories, and I think you have to take that into consideration when you talk about him in any kind of a meaningful way. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, he had really good comic timing, and he was working uh, in the tall tale tradition in, in, in a literary form uh, that uh, is kind of unique to Texas. Uh, if you grew up in Texas, uh, you probably your your dad or somebody your dad knew was a veteran bullshitter. And Howard grew up around him. His, his dad was one. And so the ability to tell a tale, spin a yarn, tell a joke, uh, was coin of the realm. And Howard uh, learned from some of the best. And it's interesting that he took that um, oral thing, that oral tradition, and wrote it down and turned it into um, this stuff that resonated with the guys in New York. They. Uh, they, they, he'd get letters from uh, the guys uh, doing fight stories saying, I'm really glad that you're sending more Costigan stories. Everybody here at the, in the office is, is all for him. You know, it's like, cool. You know, and he got fan letters from, uh, uh, from his uh, editor and, and the people that, uh, that read those stories. Uh, there, it wasn't like in Weird Tale where they, were, where they would print them, but he had, uh, he had a following for those because they bought nearly every one that he sent. There were only a couple that got rejected. Were you going to read something? Well, yeah, I, 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 just with a little preface. You know, we, we're talking about Howard's love of boxing, right? But um, he also had a good, pretty good, while he's a huge boxing fan, he had a good understanding of other combat sports that were around at the time, or at least a smattering. He had a better knowledge than the average person. 
Uh, you know, he had an understanding. He, he, we know that he watched pro wrestling, for example, uh, which even by the 1920s and 30s was already being, as they say, worked, uh, predetermined, that sort of thing. And Howard was aware of that. He talks about it in his in his letters. You know, he know he knows that wrestling's fake, but there's always but those guys. You know, they, they can do the real thing when they know. You know, if they're the right, right hook. You know, yeah. right. The right hook. The big yeah. money ring. Right, right, right. And, then, and so he did that. He, he's he's what they call in wrestling terms a smart mark, right? Somebody that knows it's quote fake, but still likes it anyway, and he knows that guys can shoot, which is to you know to do submission wrestling for real, right? So he understood that. Um, in some of his, in the Breckenridge Elkin stories, the westerns, he writes about uh, what was called rough and tumble fighting. This was a style of fighting on the frontier in the 19th century that involved uh, grappling and pinning your opponent and trying to gouge their eyes out and bite their their ears true, and nose off. True right. violence. I mean, really. Just, you know, this was this was a style of fighting on the frontier. Um, uh, how many uh, uh, the, uh, the there's <coughs> very few depictions of this in westerns. Uh, the recent one time in um, the HBO show. Uh, oh, Dead, uh, Deadwood. 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 In Deadwood, you got the one fight between uh, the captain uh, and what's his name here, where they they showed him biting each other's ears off and trying to gouge an eye out, okay. and that was one crazy. Of the few, right, few attempts of showing a rough and tumble fight. Uh, so this is kind of a lost thing in our culture. You could never see it, but Howard wrote about it. He knew about this guy. And earlier yeah. you had said right. you, you you talked about the violence. Right. And, and oftentimes, uh, one of my, in fact, my my own dad said to me, he was. No one fights like this. Yeah. This is too violent. It's, yeah. it's almost comedic, the violence. But actually, it, 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 it comes from an American tradition. Yeah. The, the English were horrified when they came over. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, after the, the, the West was being settled. Right. It was a style of fighting that came from sort of the Scotch Irish pioneers, essentially. You know, that yes, he did that. So, and, and Howard had, a, had knowledge of this. He writes about it actually, you know, he and his friends practicing rough and tumble fighting. <laughs> How you practice eye gouging, I, you know, I have no idea. So that was probably an exaggeration <laughs> a little bit like he's wont to do. <laughs> but he had a good understanding of these things. How many people are familiar with uh, mixed martial arts and like, like ultimate fighting, right? Just you guys are familiar with this? So, a lot of people don't realize there were actually a lot of mixed style fights in the early part of the 20th century going around. But you know, this is another thing that's kind of lost in our culture. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu was actually a very uh, big uh, sport. And you know, when people thought of Asian martial arts in the early part of the 20th century, they didn't think about karate or kung fu or taekwondo. They thought about Jiu-Jitsu and its sport version, Judo. Um, and so for those who aren't, aren't familiar with the art, Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, it's, it's a grappling martial art with submission holds and throws and this sort of thing. Howard had some knowledge of this, and it shows up a few times in his stories. Um, there, were other, but there were other martial arts at the time, and there were mixed fights in those days. You would get boxers versus wrestlers and things like that. One of the fam most famous ones was John L. Sullivan against uh, the wrestling champion Will William Muldoon. But, so these things were going on, and Howard occasionally talked about that as well. One of the, the coolest things that, that hasn't really been pointed out is that one of the Steve Costigan stories, he has Steve Costigan fight in basically a tournament where at first he fights a French savat fighter, which is sort of a form of kick, kickboxing, um, a French style. And then after that, he fights a Japanese jiu-jitsu fighter. Um, and then goes on to fight another, a boxer after that. So in some ways, this is one of the first fictional mixed martial arts stories, this Staler Steve Costigan story. And so this is something that hasn't been uh, really played up very well, but I think it's kind of a cool thing. This knowledge that he had, you know, we, we sort of take mixed martial arts for granted today, but this was not a, this is not a big thing that's been in popular culture, you know, for very long, certainly not in the early part of the 20th century. So let me read a little passage here of uh, Sailor Steve Costigan fighting a jiu-jitsu fighter. This is kind of funny. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next event, Sailor Steve Costigan and Peter Nagoya of the Anglo-Chinese ship, the Mongol. Weight 200 pounds. As before, Costigan will use only straight boxing, hitting only above the belt. Nagoya will be allowed to wrestle and strike with his bare fists. Nagoya was a stocky, a stocky square built man, a half caste he was, with melee, French, and Japanese in him. A tough customer he was, with big, and, uh, he was big and smooth like a big seal. His muscles didn't bulge, they rippled under his glossy skin, and he moved as quick and easy as a cat. I knew better than to rush wide open. I come in fast but wary, and he backed away, half crouching, his big long arms swinging wide and low. So he understands, right, you know, that you know, the, the, you know, sort of the wrestler's crouch, he's ready to shoot in, right? Um, you know, Howard, he's got some knowledge here, he knows what's going on. Uh, I sprang in, hook it hard for his head. He sidestepped and I plunged past him, whirling in a big hurry. He was already leaping for me. 
but he checked himself almost in midair and threw up his arms to block the savage right hook I shot at his jaw. I whipped the left after it as quick as I could, as quick as I couldn't hit, as quick as I could sit. Uh, and he moved his bullet head and let it slide past. Just a second, my left was extended its full length, right? He's throwing a jab. And in that second, he grabbed my left, left wrist with both hands and he wheeled and he throwed me clean over his, head, over his head. I've seen the ring turn in somersaults as I pinwheeled in the air and come down on my back so hard it shook the whole house. The wind was just about knocked out of me. But I've seen Nagoya bounding across the ring towards me like a big dusky cat. And I sprang up just as he rushed in. I fainted with my left again and he grabbed it. As he grabbed, he twisted with some kind of leverage hold. Something snapped in my elbow and an agonizing pain shot up my arm. But at the same instant, I ripped a slung shot uppercut up between Nagoya's arms. It crashed square under his jaw and his head snapped back like it was on hinges. And he went to his knees. At nine, he weaved up again, but a right hook to the ear dropped him again where he lay till his handlers carried him out of the ring. I walked back into my corner. My left arm was numb and getting stiff, but I said nothing. We still got another fight you know, later on. The crowd was yelling and cheering and I grinned. They might not have noted, but they was getting a sight more action than they'd have got had shifted Strouza and Ben Goldstein been prancing and tapping in that ring. Say, said the handler Barlow and Gibby, by some strange whim, it wasn't a Seagirl man of the house. Didn't I hear something crack when Pete grabbed your arm the last time? His jaw, I reckon. I growled. So, so Howard, he had some understanding, right? You know, he got uh, he gets thrown with a jitter throw, right? He gets his arm caught in. You know, it's difficult to say. You know, what kind of you know arm bar? He doesn't or, tap. You know, he doesn't tap. He doesn't tap. No, he doesn't tap, does it? He takes he takes it, and he, you know manages to get lucky. You know, and I think it's interesting that Howard really plays up. You know, the jiu-jitsu guy here, right? I mean, of course, costing him to kind of win, you know, but he gets his arm popped, you know, at the same time. So, um, and, and doing a little bit of research about this, um, I, I have a feeling I know where Howard, where Howard was getting this from. Uh, in the Ring Magazine, um, are you, anybody familiar with the Ring Magazine? This was a the boxing, boxing magazine, the Bible of Boxing. It's a boxing magazine that started in 1923. It's still being published today. Um, it was it's the boxing publication for the 20th century. You know, that was that was the main boxing magazine. And Howard read it. He, Howard contributed to it. Um, he wrote letters in. He had a poem in there. But uh, in one of the early issues, and I, I still haven't tracked it down. I know it was in there, but I haven't been able to actually find a copy because they're very tough to get the early issues. But in an early 1924 issue, there's accounts of what were called American fights. Um, that was slang for American style fighting that were taking place in the Pacific uh, during the early part of the 20th century where you would have American boxers fighting uh, you know, Japanese jiu-jitsu guys and in some cases if it was in, you know, French Indochina, you know, Southeast Asia, you would have Savat guys and things like that. And there were some accounts in the Ring Magazine of some of those fights that took place. One in particular that was a famous one was an American boxer who got his arm broken by a jiu-jitsu guy in one of those fights. And so it's probable that Howard read that, and that was the inspiration for this story. So he's, you know, he's very much into this and understanding the, the idea of human combat, right? What can humans do to each other physically with no ball, no teams, man to man, you know, the, you know, the ultimate uh, human contest, right? Human chess, you know, and that's, and that's funny. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was just looking at uh, this passage from... Um, Waterfront Fists, uh, the depiction of Red Roach, uh, who was uh, uh, a fictional disguised uh, version of um, the blacksmith group. Red Roach is um, Fitzsimmons, Bob Fitzsimmons. Uh, Bob, Bob Fitzsimmons, Fitzsimmons Ruby Red. Uh, Australian. <laughs> yes, Ruby Red, Gangly. Bob Fitzsimmons. Yeah. I want to read this piece here from um, Viking, uh, from uh, Waterfront Fists. Because this is, uh, he's, he's actually, he's substituted an actual boxer for the fictional opponent. But it's this guy, no doubt about it. Um, well, I glanced over to the opposite corner and saw Red Roach for the first, and I hope last, time. He was tall and raw bone and the ugliest human I ever seen. He had freckles, as big as mess pans all over him. His nose was flat and his low slanting forehead was topped by a shock of the most scandalously red hair I ever laid eyes on. <coughs> when he rose up from his stool, I seen he was knock kneed. When he came to the center of the ring to pretend to listen to instructions, I was disgusted to note he was also cross-eyed. 
At first I thought he was counting the crowd and I was slightly disconcerting to finally decide he was glaring at me. <laughs> we went back to our quarters, the gong sounded, the scrap started, and I got another jolt. Red come out, right foot and right hand forward. He was left handed. I was so disgusted I come near lightning and giving him a good cussing. Red headed, cross eyed and left handed. And he was the first good port cider I'd ever met in a ring. Now, uh, he goes into uh, what it goes, what, what, what you have to do when you fight a, a, a left-handed boxer. And uh, I wanted to read that part because it's just funny uh, oh. to me. Uh, With his cross eye. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, it's, it's what he says. Uh, As I sat in my corner sniffing the smell of salt and watching Red's handlers massaging his suffering belly, I thought deeply. A very rare habit of mine while fighting. I do not believe in too much thinking. It gives a fighter the headache. <laughs> Still and all, with my jaw aching from Red's left and my eyes getting strained from watching his unholy face, I rubbed the nose Mike stuck into my glove and meditated. A left-hander is a right-hander backwards. Nine times out of ten, his straight right will beat your left jab. If you lead your right to a right-hander, he'll beat you to the punch with his left. But you can lead your right to a left-hander because his left has as far to travel as your right. So he actually knows the strategy for fighting a port cider. Which is all he knows technically correct. Yeah. yeah. It just sounds uh, funny when you read it like that. It's funny, <laughs> it's funny when you read it like that. And so how he, he was able to, to disguise uh, <clears throat> some deep boxing knowledge in uh, what's ultimately a story about a girl who tricks him into fighting so that uh, she can basically steal his wallet and, and get out of town. Uh, he's not real lucky with the dames. Uh, <laughs> Groove, you got something? You know, I do. I was gonna. Re I actually was gonna read um, the Weeping Willow, unpublished story. Uh, I I'm not gonna though. Um, I, I think you need to read it yourself because I think everybody's internal oh, yeah, yeah, internal yeah. voice it will make this better. The, we, you guys remember Weeping oh, Willow, right? It. Oh my word, what a! <laughs> it's, it's ridiculously funny. <laughs> it, it's 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 almost sad when you read this whole story from beginning to end. Uh, it's a very short story too, but I'm not going to read that one. Uh, I, I was just thinking about something. I was at the Howard House today. Remember that white bulldog sitting underneath the? Uh, uh, that, oh, yeah. that was that was yeah. that was in the um, the drugstore. Drug yep. Uh, okay, so in the Caskin stories, most of you know this already, but the ones that don't, he's got a faithful sidekick. Okay, his name is Mike, uh, named after uh, Mike Mike um, Iron Mike. Uh, which is his brother, his older brother. And actually, Iron Mike actually ascended it a little bit higher than Steve did. They're both Iron Men, okay? But Mike, Mike the Bulldog is a character all, all unto his own. And I had a, I had a pit bull uh, that I, I was used to be a dog trainer. And um, I had this beautiful dog, and it was just so fun. And these stories, I started realizing that, you know, Mike the Bulldog was as important to me in these stories as, say, Steve Koskin or any member of the Sea Girl. And then, uh, uh, was it Fist of the Desert? The opening scene of Fist of the, Fist oh. of the Desert, oh, oh, it's great. Uh, Man of Pe was it Man of Peace? Uh, with um, the, the dog that cringes all over the place. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. Dogs feature prominently in these stories, too. So now you have this attachment that's not just violence and boxing, it's just love. Mike, however, <laughs> is, is a true character. I told you earlier that uh, there, was a, there was a story, um, two stories, uh, that you know, made me cry. My dog didn't live as long as I'd liked him to have lived. Uh, he's eight years old, he had cancer, but he was all white bulldog, he was great, uh, just beautiful dogs. And I named, I named him Carl, I wanted to name him Mike, my wife wouldn't let me. She said, they're not calling no dog Mike. <laughs> you know, so I, I wasn't allowed to call Sonia Steve, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. But anyhow, uh, there's, there's many, many touching scenes um, amidst the violence. In fact, violence kind of like is the storm cloud sometimes over some truly beautiful moments. And I know I'm kind of selling this is big, and I won't be able to read it as well as, as, or unless you'd like to read it for me. Nobody can read it as well. Yeah. Nobody, so nobody can do so it like that. In the bulldog breed. If you want a kiss, you can have it. We talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on now. A little more John. Hold on now. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, we talk about with, with uh, any of these Ironmen is what? Their, their ability to take it, take it but, and, and do what? Just never, keep, never, never, keep never give up. Keep, never keep coming going. back, keep coming yeah. back. Never go down. And well, almost you always, down, you get up. Yeah. almost always the Ironmen are. They're athletic, they're, they're, they're um, physically fit, but they lack the, the, the skill. And almost always the civilized person, the, 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 the more intelligent uh, uh, 
antagonist is skilled. They're highly skilled. They're the, in fact, they're the Floyd Mayweathers. Right. Okay. Right. They're the Floyd Mayweathers of all these stories, and and uh, you know, Costigan and, and all these his his uh, protagonists are, are almost always the Rockies. You know, right. this this if grut, not, if not grit, right, yeah. right, 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 right. <laughs> A little of that thrown in, right? Yeah. Rivers of blood. Uh, <laughs> And so what you have in this particular story, Bulldog Breed, is a setup, right? Uh, the dog uh, is, is minding his own business in a bar. They're having, you know, they're hanging out. Say, uh, Koskin's a sailor, sailor Steve Koskin. He, he, uh, he, his dog gets kicked and then hit with a uh, cane, which knocks the dog out. And, you know, Koskin's not really known for his, his uh, soft demeanor. He thinks yeah. he is. He tells himself so, but he's not. And he loses it. He, he knocks this he, guy he out. He goes red. Yeah. He, doesn't, he doesn't know after he knocks this guy out that the guy he knocked out was the champion of the French Navy, I think it is. He's, yeah. a, he's a professional boxer yeah. uh, with, with the skills to boot. And um, it challenges, to, challenges him to a duel. And he thinks, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this guy uh, out to the cleaners. I challenge you to box. And they all laugh. Everyone, they're, in, they're in this port, and everyone's, you know, there's French, there's Japanese, there's Everybody all these people. Everybody knows who the French. But they all know who he is, except for Steve Costigan. And the, you know, he 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 doesn't care. He thinks he's going to get it on this guy. He gets in the ring and he re he realizes within the first 30 seconds that he's in with with a professional, somebody who who uh, was ranked in the world. I mean, this is a truly skilled man, uh, and he he hurts Costigan. It's the first time in his in his career where he's literally just getting the crap knocked out it, of him. It, it's a tough story. And over and over, page after page of just abuse, physical abuse. Um, and he comes back, you know, his legs start going, he's, he's walking like this. And if you, ever, if you ever hit a bag, for instance, just a heavy bag for three minutes straight, <laughs> it, it's really tiring. And then you get in and you start sparring with somebody. Well, when they're really hitting you, it is, it is a hard thing to do. You, you, your, your lungs, they expand as big as they can to get as much air and you're you can't get it out fast, nothing's working right, and then they're hitting you in, in, in all these parts of your body where <coughs> breathing becomes difficult, or, which is, it's, it's just a very difficult endeavor, okay? And this story is almost masochistic in, in the amount of, and he, for the first time ever, he's not, gonna, he's not gonna make it, or we think. So I'm just gonna read a, a, a little section here. I, I've set the table. Uh, he's fighting for the honor of his dog. He's not going to let anybody abuse animals. And there's other instances, several, several stories, where, where uh, kindness to animals, uh, cruelty to animals is paramount, foremost in his mind. I mean, and it is really something that Howard also believed in, we know through the letters. We yep. uh, you know how he felt about people who uh, pit fighting right. and you know, things yeah. of, of that nature. Right. So this, is a, this, this really touches me. And I happened to read this the first time with my dog's head in my lap as he was uh, getting close to the, uh, what, I think, how, how old was, was he when I was reading this? Like a, maybe a year, you know, he, he was still kind of a pup. He, my dog had a huge head, and he just lay it there, and I'd, I'd read, and one of my wife's cats would sit on me, and I'm <laughs> trying to read. I'm reading this thing, and I'm thinking, my dog w would do the same thing. I, we had this great relationship, and there was, so this is another personal connection. Now I was free, facing Francois, and I noticed he had a black eye and a deep gash under his cheekbone. Though I don't remember putting him there. I don't remember anything. He also had welts of plenty on his body. I'd been handling out punishment as well as taking it, I saw. Now his eyes blazed with a desperate light, and he rushed in, hitting, in, hitting as hard as ever for a few seconds. The blows rained so fast I couldn't think, and yet I knowed I must be clean body. Punch drunk, because it seemed like I could hear familiar voices yelling my name. The voices of the crew of the Sea Girl, who'd never yell for me again. Now he had left the, he had left the Sea Girl earlier, too. Uh, he, he couldn't find anybody to second him in this fight, so he was all alone in this, this, this area, and he was willing to go to bat for his dog all by himself in a, in a native land, or another area that he was not native to. Everybody was against him. I was on the canvas, and this time I felt that it was to stay. Dim and far away, I saw Francois, and somehow, I could tell, his legs were trembling, and he's shaking like he had a chill, but I couldn't reach him now. I tried to get my legs under me, but they wouldn't work. I slumped back on the canvas, crying with rage and weakness. He, he didn't want to be there. I mean, every, every, every aspect of his body is, wants to get up and finish the fight, but he can't. For the first time, he can't do it, and it's just, he can't even take it. He doesn't know how to deal with it. Then, through the noise, I heard one deep, mellow sound, like an old Irish bell almost, Mike's bark. 
He wasn't a barking dog. Only on special occasions did he give tongue. This time, he only barked once. I looked at him, and he seemed to be swimming in a fog. If a dog ever had his soul in his eyes, he had it then. He plain as speech, them eyes said, Steve, old kid, get up and hit one more blow for the glory of the breed. I tell you, the average man has to, got to be fighting for somebody else besides himself. If it's fighting for a flag, a nation, a woman, a kid, or a dog that makes a man win. And I got up, I don't know how. But the look in Mike's eyes dragged me off the canvas just as the referee opened his mouth to say 10. But before he could say it, in the midst I saw Francois's face, white and desperate. The pace had told. Them blows I'd landed from time to time under the heart had sapped his strength. He'd punched himself out of me. But more than anything else, the knowledge that he was up against the old bulldog breed licked him. I drove my right smash into his face, and his head went back like it was on hinges, and the blood spattered. He swung his right to my head, and it was so weak I laughed, blowing out a haze of blood. I ran my left to his ribs, and as he bent forward, I crashed my right to his jaw. He dropped, and crouching there on the canvas, half supporting himself on his hands, he was counted out. I reeled across the ring and collapsed with my arms around Mike, who was whining deep in his throat and trying to lick my face off. The first thing I, re I felt on coming to was a cold, wet nose burrowing into my right hand, which seemed numb. Then somebody grabbed my hand and nearly shook it off, and I heard a voice say, Hey, you old showback. You want to break an unconscious man's arm? And he goes on to talk a little bit more. Uh, he was trying to save the, you know, Save the honor both of, of his ship, but also for his dog. But at the end, they're all raising their, their glasses to, to uh, Sailor Steve Koskin for, for uh, fighting this guy, Francois, who had also, by the way, done a wrong to the old man, yeah. the captain of the sea girl. Uh, so he did it for the ship as well. But at the end, he says, uh, says now oh, they say to him, now we'll have a bottle open and drink to Yankee ships and Yankee sailors, especially Steve Costigan. Before you do, I said, Drink to the boy who stands for everything them aforesaid ships and sailors stands for. Mike of Dublin, an honest gentleman and born mascot of all fighting men. I remember reading this story, my dog's just staring at me. And I just, ah, oh, it, it was so powerful. There's, there's like probably 50 passages in this volume alone where Mike just steals the scene. Uh, so um, that, that's a that's a really personal right. one for me. So we probably need to wrap this up. Yeah. I, I'm gonna. I'm, I, I just want to. I just want to quickly tell you what 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 Mike did for me. Yeah. The All right. First time I read him. Okay. This was this this was the Mike that moved me. Uh, uh, this is from the Destiny Gorilla, the first one I ever read, and when I realized I was in trouble. Uh, <laughs> Costigan has met Teddy Blaine, the dancing girl, that he's about to help, and she says. <laughs> I love this. Sit down, said the girl, pulling me up a chair. Right. I've done so. Yeah, the fight had cleared my head, and as I looked at my companion, my heart pounded violently in my great, strong, manly bosom. <laughs> she was so pretty, she made me dizzy. She sat down on another chair and scanned me admiringly, which caused me to involuntarily expand my huge chest and flex my massive biceps. <laughs> <laughs> you must be Sailor Costigan, she said, and this must be Mike, your famous fighting dog. Well, I don't fight him in the pitch, but they ain't a dog in the Orient that could stand up to him four rounds. Shake hands with the lady, Mike. <laughs> He'd done so, but rather coldly. The softer passions mean very little to Mike. Sometimes it seems like he ain't got no sentiment at all. <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> like, I just love the idea of the dog going, hmm. <laughs> Fine, we'll, 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 we'll go on with this charade, but... You're temporary, and we both know it. Uh, um, thank you guys for being here. Does anybody have any questions? Let's get some questions. You guys have designated drivers to get back over there. <laughs> well, I'm got, sure you don't know, know what I mean by that. <laughs> yes, sir. What are, like, what are the collections you guys have? Oh, that's right a now? great question. What books y'all are reading from? Here, take a look. Come on. <laughs> This is Robbie Howard Foundation, Howard Foundation Press. Press called Fist this of is uh, round one, round okay. two, round three, and round four. Yeah, I've got higher stories in the. It was yep. it was co-edited so. by me and Gruber, uh, along with Patrice Louane. Gruber and I specifically traded off on the introductions, and we wrote them in a in a back and forth order. So if you read all four introductions together, it's kind of our unified theory uh, yeah. on the boxing. Right world of Robert E. Howard. Yeah. So for the first time ever, in four volumes, all of, of Howard's boxing fiction all of the in one stuff. place. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me re repeat that because it bears repeating. Yes. Four volumes. Yeah. 
right? The Wandering what? Star Conans are only three volumes, right? The, the Del Rey Conans are only three volumes, four volumes of box and stories. This was a huge chunk of his his ouvroir, yes, right? His his uh, his, uh, his canon right here, man. I think I think you mean ouvroir. Yeah, Patrice didn't need him. Patrice didn't need him. Yeah. 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 Yes, they are, yes right. they are available for sale at the, uh, at the foundation. Right. Tent. Now, now volumes three and four are going pretty fast, so if you're interested, yep. get on down. Uh, real quick, if you guys want to take a look, uh, one of the things I've been on today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so here we are. This is not the original building, okay? Um, the original building, uh, I think, succumbed to a tornado uh, strike right. here and was destroyed. They kept bricks. Uh, so here's a brick <laughs> from the uh, original uh, ice house that I... The slab. Had to, I just had to have. The slab is real. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the ground you're standing on, this is this is, this is actual this, hollow ground. This hollow was the ground yeah. where, where they fall. Wow. Yeah. Oh, one one other thing. You know, I heard someone go, "Wow, I didn't know that." Uh, there, are, I think there were more Costigans published than Conan, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And there were certainly more written. Yes. Uh, it, it, just w when you stop to think about that, there's, there's you know those Conan volumes are pretty thick, right? Yeah. And here we've got just one character. Right. Took up two of these thick volumes. Two, yeah, volume okay. two and three and, are both costumes. And those were written sh small. They're, these are, you know, 15, 20 page stories, right? Yeah, right. Uh, so <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot in here. There's a lot of fun. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. This is some, This is absolutely a labor of love. This is my buddy. Yes. <laughs> this is my other buddy. Hey. hey here, 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 here we go. Hey. We love doing this, right, and this is. Just gonna pour the last of the bottle in these three. Let's yeah. finish this puppy off. One, one final thank you, right, guys. guys. Right. Here, uh, Skull. Skull. Skull.